Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcade Economics and an action-packed episode tonight because last night, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell was appearing on 60 Minutes and well, he was good for a big rally in gold, at least for a couple of hours today. Here you can see the red line spiked up quite a bit. Silver having an even better day, as we will dig into in today's video, which is quite action-packed because there's Fed Powell, HSBC losing gold. Um, geez, we have the updated figures for the ETFs. Um, also a slow Kitco silver chart, which we will see, but a bunch of big stories. Here you can see silver now, uh, even on Kitco above 17 bucks. Open 1660, uh, according to the Kitco chart, went as high as 1750-ish. I saw investing.com even last night had 1760. So I think the price is a bit higher than Kitco here. Anyway, let us get started because a lot to cover. And we'll start with Jerome Powell because he went on 60 Minutes. And I think if you've been watching the show for a while, maybe you can tell, maybe not. But I put a lot of effort into being respectful and not focusing on the negative and certainly slandering anyone's character. But, gee, it's, it's hard to see some of the things that he said on TV last night and to believe that he genuinely believes that. But as the great Warner Wolf once, or many more times than once said, let's go to the videotape. So we will start with clip number one. As this period of time grows longer, what begins to happen to the economy? There's a real risk um, that if people are out of work for long periods of time, that their skills atrophy a little bit and they lose contact with the workforce. Longer and deeper recessions tend to leave behind damage to people's careers. Well, with all due respect, while there's some, maybe some semblance of truth in there, I think what a lot of people are experiencing as damaging to their careers is the Fed policy that has inflated these bubbles, which Amazingly, as you're about to see in the next couple minutes, Jerome Powell does not believe exists. So let's continue on. Fair to say you simply flooded the system with money. Yes, we did. That's another way to think about it. We did. Where does it come from? Do you just print it? We print it digitally. <laughs> so we, you know, we, as a central bank, we have the ability to create money. Uh, digitally, and we do that by buying treasury bills or, or bonds. Mm, okay, so now you've been informed it's not that the Fed is printing money. They're printing money digitally. Important distinction there. Um, I think there was even a story out today that they are now attempting a second stimulus bill. I believe I heard number of three trillion. I'll double check that one. Sounds par for the course. And Jerome Powell is going to digitally print it. And again, what's nice about economics, you don't have to take my word for any of this stuff, but just a little check and balance I have is to say it out loud sometimes where, all right, so they're going to spend $3 trillion. They don't have, this guy's going to print it digitally and that's going to fix the economy. If you're watching at home and think that sounds rather insane, you're not alone, but there was more a lot more we can do we're not out of ammunition by a long shot you know there's there's really no limit to what we can do with these lending programs that we have so there you go there's no limit i mean i guess that's not actually new news when they said they were doing unlimited quantitative easing a month or so ago so that was unlimited he's confirming there's no limit and based on last week's story about he's concerned about the outlook and getting ready to take aggressive action I'm guessing, uh, gee, within the next two weeks, I don't even know when the next Fed meeting is coming up. I guess there's probably one of those due. We'll look that up in a second, but we'll be interesting to see how gold and silver react. Obviously, they've already started rallying. I mean, right after the guy was talking, it's like the thing was taking off. Not surprisingly, um, 
but I mean, if they, <laughs> I don't know, it's aggressive action when you're already relative to unlimited printing, I would imagine it would have to be, if it's something to catch your attention at this point, people are already buying gold and silver, then uh, it will be interesting to see what happens after that. But anyway, we got more of Jerome here. Powell believes trillions in additional federal debt could be paid down over decades. The U.S. has been spending more than it's been taking in for some time, and uh, that's something we're going to have to deal with. The time to do that is when the economy is strong, when unemployment is low, when economic activity... I wish I had paused it in time. The time to do it, I could have finished the sentence, it was going to be any time other than now. Um, what's interesting here, it almost sounds as if he's reading the speeches Bernanke was giving back in 2008 and 2009, when due to the leverage and the money printing that Greenspan had put into the system, fueling the housing bubble, and then that collapsed. And of course, then wasn't the time. Nowhere in the last 10 years was it the time. And again, here you see Powell just like a typical banker or politician saying, there's going to be a time, but not on my watch. Um, and I think there's a large component of that for anyone who's ever been around uh, some of these investment banks or in the financial field. Certainly my experience was there's a large degree to which it's the thinking is, well, as long as I get my bonus blows up on the next guy's watch and what what is the uh so somehow once the coronavirus is done powell's gonna take out trillions of dollars in the balance sheet and it's somehow going to keep everything propped up even though when he raised interest rates two and a half percent in 2018 it collapsed then so i guarantee you'll never see that um i don't know if i'm legally allowed to make bets on the show but <laughs> i mean <laughs> there's there's th 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 it's impossible and there's a reason why they're printing money like they are and will never stop. But let's hear it from his words again. That is when the economy is strong, when unemployment is low, when economic activity is high. That's when you deal with that problem. This is not the time to prioritize that concern. We have the ability to borrow at low rates. We have the ability to service that debt. And I would say this is the time. Ooh, wow, he's getting me, he's getting me feisty here. A few things here, again, you know, when the economy is strong. I've been hearing that for 10 years. It wasn't strong enough during the supposed economic boom recovery because you started, uh, I believe, August of 2008, uh, monetary base Fed balance sheet about $800 billion. That went up to about $4 trillion by the time Bernanke was done with his QE programs. They took a few kernels of sand out of there in uh, 2018, that when they raised rates to 2.5%, to which was quickly reversed. And keep in mind, as we will point out shortly in the next clip, well, I'll save it for a surprise, just it's, it's so special. But um, when, when is this economic recovery going to come? I thought it was already here, yet again, we should wait another decade or two and hyperinflate the currency in between now and then. We have the ability to borrow at low rates. We have the ability to... And that's, I think, the first of what... I don't know if that would count as an official lie, but no, they don't have the, bar, the ability to borrow at low rates because typically you see a lot of people when rates go down, refinance their mortgage, which is what you would think, especially with a lot of short-term debt the United States would do and would seemingly make sense, but... You need a lender unless you're playing a shell game, which is pretty much what they're doing. But there's no one, if they, if they tried to refinance and they found there was no offer, there was no one to refinance from, that's when you would see interest rates jump up. And I mean, just the interest expense alone on now $25 trillion of debt whatever the real number is. So when he's saying that they can just refinance this, all right, well then why haven't you? And I would suggest because you can't, so we'll. Low rates, oh. we have the ability to service that debt. And I would say this is the time when we can use. They have the ability to service that debt. I don't think that's true either, but. 
that strength to our longer run benefit. All right. Um, quick note, since I'm editing here and I can make little cuts, I did look up next Fed meeting, June 9th to 10th. Um, but we have another clip here from Jerome before we get to that. After all, he says, this emergency is nothing like 2008. This is not because there was some inherent problem, a housing bubble or something like that, or the financial system in trouble, nothing like that. The economy was fine. The financial system was fine. We're doing this to protect ourselves from the virus. Now, I mean, I'm not going to say how anybody else should live, but gee, I'm glad I don't go on TV and say things like that because... I think that fits into the category of flat out lying here because of course what Jerome Powell does not acknowledge, the Fed was doing these swap lines as far back as September of 2019, even months before anyone outside of Bill Gates even knew that Corona existed. Again, there were billions of dollars going out for nightly and Powell still never has commented on why. And so to come on to 60 Minutes and say everything was great before the crisis, and if the US economy is so strong, I mean, typically a strong balance sheet, you have money saved, all right? Your car gets hit, you, you don't have to put it on the credit card, you, you have money saved. That's a strong balance sheet, not that you resort to hyperinflation when something happens and people are out of work and the whole thing is melting down, requiring trillions upon trillions of dollars. So um, with all due respect, that seems hard to imagine that that is not a manipulative statement, in my opinion. Although I did mention Bill Gates, so we'll do one last final clip of Jerome and then move on to some more pleasant stuff. I feel like a little dirty just watching so much of that already. But here is one final one for you. Can there be a recovery without a reasonably effective vaccine? Assuming there's not a, a second wave of, uh, of, uh, of the coronavirus, I think you'll see the economy recover steadily through the second half of this year. So for the economy to fully recover, people will have to be fully confident. And that, that may have to await the arrival of, of, of a vaccine. If well, there you go. I just thought that was special to stick in a plug for the vaccine at the tail end of it. So anyway, all right, enough of that nonsense for a while. Let's get back to some of the other news stories that have been going on here. So as mentioned the other day, you can see HSBC lost nearly 200 million in a single day amid gold market turbulence. And scrolling down here, we talked about a little with Dave Prantzler over the weekend. HSBC attributed the massive loss to the unprecedented widening of the gold exchange for physical basis, reflecting COVID-19 related challenges in gold refining and transportation. Uh, all right, so they're blaming $200 million loss on exchange for physicals. Certainly the exchange for physicals is a rather complex and opaque part of the market so i guess that's not impossible yet gee it just seems hard to imagine that if they lost 200 200 million in a single day that that was not somehow related to a bank short position um let's see did uh, talk about the spot prices diverging uh, and Part of the reasons why it's a little difficult for me to take HSBC at their word, because here we have a story from Ronan Manley amid London gold turmoil, HSBC taps Bank of England for GLD gold bars. Um, further coverage of the game of musical chairs. Ronan has been doing some incredible reporting this year in my own personal opinion. It was great having him on the show a couple months ago when he, again, from his perspective, which I may well agree with, thought this paper scheme is pretty close to coming to an end. Heard Alistair McLeod on King World News over the weekend also was talking about he sees it unraveling within the year. Uh, I say that not for anyone to go and put time bets on these things, but just to me, it's interesting 
in a situation where just everybody sees their own different data points and like myself, a lot of folks thinking that this is closer to coming to an end sooner than later. Um, anyway, yeah, that's a nice room to have there. <laughs> nice uh, chunk of gold in the Bank of England gold vaults. Uh, a lot of good stuff in here. It's a bit technical, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing tonight. But if you really want to dig into the mechanics and track some of these things, um, you know, and what's going on, Ronan does some great reporting there. And I guess another reason why I'm not a big fan of HSBC or anything they do, in addition to being the custodian. So again, for all the folks who are looking at GLD and SLV, just know that your custodian HSBC, I don't know if my face is covering that. I'll try and move that block. But it says knowingly helped Mexican cartels launder billions. And then again, we have JP Morgan described as a criminal racket by the Department of Justice um, charged with the RICO statute. So that's who's the custodian of these trusts. And if you caught Dave Kranzler's interview yesterday, or depending on when you're watching this, it was published yesterday. Uh, he had a glorious little rant about that, which I'm going to chop into a separate clip just so that Anytime anyone has any questions about GLD or SLV or why there are so many concerns, uh, we'll get that up there soon. Quick look at the ETFs this week. Uh-oh, I'm going to try and make my head smaller because it's blocking all the headlines. Uh, but I'll guide you through it anyway. We can see here is the weekly silver holdings. Was a, Took a slight pause for two weeks and then back in force. That's a big chunk there, 18, wow, 18 million ounces. They had about 15 million. Their one last week was 10, 25. Again, not that there's an official calculation here, but I just find it interesting how Ted Butler, who I certainly think is one of, I mean, he's the certainly unquestionably the forefather of studying silver manipulation, and one of the top places I go to uh, keep, keep posted on what's going on. And when I talked with him once, he mentioned he thought that the primary driver of the move in 2011 was that 60 million ounces were added into these trusts. And I mean, we've had 60 million ounces in the last month or two alone, let alone this big jump from a billion to almost 1150. So you've had over 200 million ounces go in there. I don't see if uh, Jerome Powell is getting ready to do the next quantitative easing package, something more aggressive than unlimited, how that's gonna change. Again, some big numbers in gold. And this again, well, I hope to one day be able to more eloquently explain the mechanics. Some of it, you know, where I'm just figuring out as we go along, but I think this is all connected to what you see happening with HSBC. Um, and certainly by all means, I'd like to be wise enough at some point, in my elder age, I'm 41 now, I guess I'm getting older, not to tell anybody else what to do, but I mean, again, outside of, you know, if you think the Fed meeting's coming up and you want to put a short-term bet on, okay. But I mean, if you're looking at gold and silver as a hedge against the insanity that's happening right now, even if you really wanted something digital, get Andrew McGuire's Kinesis. There's Vault Chain. Rick Rule's part of a bunch of mining companies. I mean, at least some of these things are audited and some of them actually have smaller fees too. So, you know, by all means, do what suits you best. But uh, that is my thoughts on GLD and SLV for anyone who is curious about those. Although when you wonder why is all this metal flowing in, uh, I wonder if it could be related to something. We probably talked about this a little bit last week, but Trump hails the gift of negative interest rates that official, Fed officials disdain. Keep in mind to achieve negative. And when you hear all these, like, sorry if I take it for granted sometimes, maybe some people are new to this and don't actually understand what it means. 
but to get the interest rate lower requires printing, adding additional credit into the system, AKA printing money. So while he's saying he wants negative rates, which is the insanity extent of printing money, he is also simultaneously pivoting to embrace a strong US dollar. That's a great word. I wanna use that in some of my headlines. The gold and silver market pivoted on Jeremy Powell's uh, hyperinflation promises. I mean, it's like he's, it's like Powell's competing with Shinzo Abe. And I think he, who knows, he may win. But Donald Trump may be warming to a strong dollar. Um, it's great time to have a strong dollar. Okay, maybe I didn't read the, the previous one here. Uh, well, where did it go? But, <laughs> I mean... He wants a strong dollar and he wants negative interest rates. The uh, comments contrast with the remarks during his presidency in, the, in which he has railed against dollar strength. I don't know if they would count negative interest rates in there, but good to see at least somebody mentioning it. Again, quick look at the price of gold. We'll call it 1734-ish on the Kitco, probably a bit higher on investing.com. But again, just an interesting observation. You saw both of the metals rally last night. Maybe uh, China was watching 60 Minutes and just buying gold hand and fist. And what's interesting though, they both got smacked down today. I guess you had to wonder how long that was going to take. But here's silver finishing higher on the day versus gold really got thumped pretty good, down 30 bucks there. And just a little unusual because if there's a time when they don't act in tandem, it's usually silver taking the more thorough drubbing. Not the case today. Again, the uh, things are certainly heating up. I am of the school of thought. I say this not to influence anybody else to do anything, but just in my own internal calculations, um, which we'll be digging into in an exciting option webinar later this week to be posted. But I see it as at least 50-50 at least or above that something finally happens this year, whether that's a force majeure or a complete failure of these exchanges. I mean, I guess at the same time, I've learned in the last nine years that it can always go on longer, but when you just combine all of the different things people are seeing and then what's happening with the price and in the world, again, if you had an environment where the Fed was pretending like in the past that they were going to raise interest rates, that would be one thing. But I mean, they're already doing unlimited printing and saying that's not enough. So silver, as you can see, about 1720-ish at the moment. Um, and it was interesting, a story from last week, First Majestic holding on to inventory until silver prices improve. First Majestic says it postponed the sale of 292,000 ounces of silver and 700,000 ounces of gold worth 5.3 million at the end of the quarter. Um, company says it currently holds 1.04 million ounces of silver, 1459 ounces of gold. So that's an interesting one. Um, oh, and also we see here some of the company's mines had to reduce operations in April due to COVID, but Keith Newmeyer says full production will reach again from all operations by early July. So that's certainly good news to hear. But First Majestic, I mean, they're not some podunk junior miner. That's the biggest, large, uh, pure, largest pure silver play. And if they're withholding production because they think the price is rigged, and I'll tell you another thing without naming any names. As you know, I've talked to many mining executives on the show. And I know there's a school of thought that some of these guys don't want to hear it and they don't want to talk about it because they're worried about getting their financing pulled. I've been surprised, as you've heard, if you've been watching, a lot of people, they mention it. They're darn intrigued when I say it. And if companies are now withholding metal, that's just another factor on the supply. So, <laughs> I'm just crazy silver bug, but we'll see how this one goes. A few last ones to wrap up. 
just thought this was interesting from, again, last week, clearing out all those stories. But from Pepsi to GM, big advertisers set to cancel commitments to TV networks. Gee, I don't think that's, well, wow, that's some <laughs> very red imagery there on that Coca-Cola. Uh, I don't know if we've ever seen something like this. And then I think about these sports leagues. Uh, I know the baseball union and the owners are duking it out. Football, they're hoping to start on time. But, gee, talk about big advertisers. I mean, these are some of the staples are seeking to walk back spending commitments they made. So I, I've always wondered how it would work out with the sports teams. Uh, I've heard some folks say that they think I heard someone say that they thought as many as half of the teams might be up for sale in the next couple of years. Certainly will be interesting to keep an eye on and things like this could be a big factor there. Here you can see the effects of not being a Bloomberg subscriber and hitting the limits of their articles. So I don't have this one pulled up, but thought it was interesting. March saw a biggest drop in foreigners treasury pile. And I mean, I know the Wall Street establishment likes to assume that anyone who wasn't born in Manhattan is a complete moron. But I mean, is it surprising that countries are leaving the auction? Uh, I don't think so. Of course, here is the debt clock, which wow, it's it's like by the Two weeks ago, it was just crossing 25. Now we're already up, tacking a quarter of the next trillion on there. Although the reason I pull this up, we did have a question in the audience this week, which uh, tried to get to as much as possible. Uh, wow, this is interesting. The dollar to silver ratio. Someone wanted to know how that was calculated. And I have to leave my mouse there. But if you look to the top middle, it has a definition the year-over-year -year increase in the U.S. M2 money supply divided by the yearly world production of silver and ounces. So they're basically saying how much money is created this year. I guess you could say it's a yearly. It's in this year for the past running year. I'm not year-over-year. -year. Who knows? Sources. Actually, they tell you. USGS and the Federal Reserve. So um, you can even do the math for yourself at home. But it's funny because I remember when we looked last week, if you go back one of the old episodes, it was 2105 an ounce. It's already jumped to 2839 and only about to get higher. Last story here. We've talked about this a little bit. Scotiabank has been pulling out of the metals business, but regulators started Scotiabank probe before metals closure filings. They've already been caught and fined before for their involvement in the precious metals. Shocked to see that they're caught up. Six current and former employees of JP Morgan had been charged since 2018, it mentions there. Um, US court filing shows that Scotia also provided around 800,000 pa pages of evidence to regulators probing JP Morgan. So that's actually kind of interesting. They're ratting out. <laughs> <laughs> Scotia is ratting out JP Morgan. I'm going to read this sentence again, um, especially because it's been a little bit of a long day here in the Arcadia Cave, and this one makes me giggle. A U.S. court ruling shows that Scotia also provided around 800,000 pages of evidence to regulators probing precious metals trading at JP Morgan and Chase. Wow. I mean, we will investigate that one more. I don't know if there's another conclusion. I don't don't want to uh, jump to conclusions there, but <laughs> what are you supposed to say to that one? Anyway, that is the fascinating world of gold and silver. I thank you for joining me tonight. Hope you enjoyed this one. And if so, and you're wondering, how is this going to play out in the silver market? Well, don't take my word for it, but just check in with the lovable Dr. Mark Faber who was on the show last night talking about why silver is $15 despite unlimited QE. And if you want to know what he had to say about that, well, then here you go. The land.